Thanks, Matt, and th thanks for having me. I think this actually fits very nicely following uh, Don and Joe, because this is about change. Uh, and it's about change about the system that Don described, but change in a very bureaucratic, sclerotic organism, which is our military health system. And I think we all know that uh, quite well. So what's our problem? Perishable skills. The system that Dr. Jenkins described, you know, we know that after conflict, we forget those critical skills. It's happened after every single conflict, and we cannot afford for that to happen again. I think we're all in agreement that that's the case. Uh, but change is really hard. This is a book that, uh, that Dave Hoyt said, hey, read this book, Wired to Resist. And the good thing was he didn't give me a paper copy because I hate paper copies. I read everything on my iPad. So I, I said, hmm, Dave Hoyt, smart guy, read this book. And I read it, downloaded it, read it. Uh, it's Wired to Resist. You can see the name of the author there. 50 to 75% of change initiatives fail. You talked about their multiple retreats and talking about problems. It's really hard to change. Uh, those failures can be both expensive and spectacular. And there's different forms of failure. There's failure to launch. There's just too much resistance to get started. There's failure to sustain. You know, you, you get, got a great idea to get started, but it's not adopted as part of your day-to-day -day work or culture. And it's failure to scale. You know, you, it works for a small part of the organization, but doesn't work for the entire organization. And the story I'm going to tell you about as a case study is a is change in evolution because we're living it right now. And this is a great article. It's uh, it's from Cotter. It's from the mid '90s. It's in Harvard Business Review. It talks about the eight stages of transforming an organization. If you take any of the business courses, uh, I, I think I learned this in the Harvard Chairs course, they go over, hey, this is how you change an organization. It's the classic paper. It's easy. Read it. Uh, and if you want to distill it, this is how I distilled it. Essentially, this is Eric Elster's version of Cotter's paper. You need a problem. The timing needs to be right, the burning platform. You need an unassailable solution. If you're going to change, you need a solution that makes sense, that everyone's going to look at and everybody's going to, going to pick at, and you need to survive that. You need to socialize up and down. The top of the organization needs to buy in. The bottom of the organization needs to buy in. And most of all, you need to be persistent. So, you know, what are these KSAs? Uh, the KSAs are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that we need as expeditionary surgeons, anesthesiologists, members of the combat casualty care team. Uh, and the problem was the way we're approaching this before this project was fragmented and wasn't working. And what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve an expert trauma system, the system that Dr. Jenkins described. And in that system, we want a combat casualty care team that can perform damage control surgery, damage control resuscitation with assessed proficiency. It's not enough that you're board certified. You need to be able to be assessed to be able to do this. We need trauma surgeons in key locations and at key positions. I'll get to the why that's an uh, important part of that. Uh, we need to have a system. We need to lead that system. Uh, we need definitive care at role threes and role fours for the non-military folks. Those are our combat support hospitals and our definitive care hospitals. We need a robust practice, uh, you know, outside of our deployments, and we need the highest quality care. We damn well better be the best at doing this. Uh, and then we re need readiness at the core of our system. The military health system is an enormous system. It's $50 billion, 9.5 million beneficiaries, 45 hospitals, I don't know, 300 clinics. It's one of the three largest healthcare systems in the country. And if we had, if we were talking about this three, four years ago, we would talk about access and primary care. Well, that's all great, but access really doesn't help us when that guy is blown up. We need to be proficient in taking care of these critically injured patients. So one of the things we had to do up front, and there was, and Matt could attest to this, many robust arguments. But one of the first things was, well, everyone needs to be a trauma surgeon. You, general surgeons can't do this. Uh, and we came back and said, no, at the core of the combat casualty care team, military general surgeons are capable and necessary to address the demands of the system and expiratory deployments. So well, how do you convince folks? Because we had a, and, you know, very robust arguments with very senior trauma surgeons. That everyone needs to be a trauma surgeon. Everyone needs to be at a level one trauma center. Not only was that probably not correct, it wasn't, it's not feasible. So if you look at the data, you go back to data, you need a unassailable solution set. You know, if you look at management of complex trauma in the context of a system, general surgeons, trauma surgeons can be proficient. Uh, but you need a system. 
And I think that was the critical message that we were trying to deliver. The other piece is, even if it were the case, everyone needs to be a trauma surgeon. Well, there's not enough trauma workload uh, across the board to support the 450 general surgeons that we need uh, within the entire military health system. Sure, there's a lot of trauma centers. A lot of trauma centers deal with ground level falls in the elderly. Not a lot deal with penetrating trauma that looks remotely close to military trauma. So we felt very strongly that, you know, that emergent elective general surgery actually is a solid foundation for being prepared. And actually that reflects what's written in the American College of Surgeons Optimal Resources for the Management of the Injured Patient. And this just shows you that, you know, the other part of this was, well, put all your surgeons in civilian partnerships. Uh, that'll solve them all. Put all our surgeons in, mili- in, in civilian trauma centers. Well, yes, that's part of the solution set. It's clear that our trauma surgeons need to practice at that level if our military hospitals can't afford that. But that alone can't solve it either. This is, a, this is taken from Bill Schwab's Winds of War paper. And you can see he mapped out those trauma centers that have high acuity and high volume. Uh, and if you assume we put three surgeons at each of those civilian trauma centers, we would only generate 105 ready general surgeons when we need over 400 uh, to meet the mission set. So we need to change the entire military health system. We need to make sure that our, and I'll show you how we do this in a little bit, how our military hospitals are seeing the right types of patients, how we're partnering when it's appropriate, and how we can measure to be effective. So, and the key, as I mentioned before, is you build a a system that mitigates risk. Uh, And if the system's working, you have that expert system. And organized approaches basically, you know, mitigate the individual component. Individual is a key part of it. You'll see how we get to this in a second. But you can't take the individual out of the system. You can't have the system without the ready individual. So we developed this basically clinical readiness, life cycle clinical readiness program that has four key elements. Number one is periodic knowledge assessment, very similar to what you just heard uh, with respect to the American Board of Surgery. In order to be successful, you need to know the knowledge, and that knowledge needs to be assessed on a regular basis. Our goal is we're doing this every three years. I'll tell you where we are with that in a moment. Then you need to maintain your clinical practice. You need a robust enough practice uh, to be ready. We can't, you know, basically be ready by doing 75 cases like the average general surgeon, which is in the, in the army, which is a mix of low acuity stuff and endoscopy. You need a robust practice of both acute and emergent, uh, general surgery. We need skills assessment. We need the ability to assess for those gap skills, those things we don't do in our routine basis, even if you're, you're in a trauma center, uh, to, assess proficiency. It's no longer enough to demonstrate a skill. You have to basically be able to show that that person is proficient. And then you're deployment ready. And if you look at this in the context of Miller's pyramid, which is educational theory, if you look at Miller's pyramid and you overlay the knowledge, skills, and abilities, you have the knows, the shows, and the does. Well, the knows is a test, a multiple choice question test that we're all used to taking. Uh, the shows is, are the skills assessments, and the does is the KSA metric. And I'll walk you very briefly through each of those and what we've learned, and then we'll come back to that discussion about how to make change in an organization. So, you know, if you look at where we were uh, and where we're going from, if you look at this from the point of view of knowledge and skills assessment, you know, we had limited awareness of of CPGs, the clinical practice guidelines. You know, we've all gone down range and looked around to, you know, the other surgeons or providers that said, hey, have you looked at the CPGs? What CPGs? What are they? What's a clinical practice guideline? That's not acceptable. We can't send people down range unless they understand the indications for a fasciotomy. There was intermittent, cl- there's intermittent clinical participation skills courses. We have some good courses as they exist right now, but you, people don't reliably go to those courses. We can't expect someone to go downrange if they can't perform a fasciotomy. We have no established instruments to measure those skills. So you go to a course and they show you how to do something. Well, did you walk out of the course and can you reliably do that? And then there's really no pathway to process, curb, monitor, and prove poor performance. You know, how do you not necessarily remediate, but retrain? You train and retrain. That's a military term that we're used to. How do we adopt that? for our specialty and our needs. So what we've done is assessment of knowledge coupled to the practices that are available by our national organizations. 
courses that, that essentially not only demonstrate but assess proficiency and the ability to train and retrain using those trauma pl sustainment platforms and training platforms, which we already have. So how do we do this? Well, essentially what we did is we took the body of knowledge, and that are, those are those CPGs, those are those case logs, those textbooks that we're all aware of, and we extracted individual assessable knowledge, skills, and abilities. These are things like demonstrate the ability to do a four compartment fasciotomy, uh, define the role of TXA in a massive transfusion protocol. So all things that are accessible. And for general surgery, we, we did this in May of 2016. Uh, we didn't have a retreat. We actually had a working meeting. We sequestered uh, 16 military surgeons, equal representation from each branch, defined deployment experience in a room up at the college for five days. And we developed this blueprint of KSAs. And we spent a lot of time going through the methodology, organized them according to the six core competencies that you all know as residents uh, you know, within the ACGME. And we came up with 488 uh, of these KSAs organized in these eight different expeditionary domains. And that became the blueprint that drove the cycle that I showed you earlier. So we, so we had a blueprint of KSAs. We realized that, you know, we kind of knew how to write questions for the knowledge assessment. We kind of knew that we had emergency war surgery and asset courses that we could define skills. And that's all great. Knowledge assessment skills, really important. But how do we make sure that our practice is robust? How do we change the military health system being focused on access and things which are probably not as important uh, to having folks you know, operating in the OR? So what we did is essentially we developed that set of KSAs and we deconstructed coding. We went to the same you know, stuff that drives reimbursement, development of RVUs, uh, and the way that works is there's a committee in the AMA called the RUC Committee, the Relative Value Update Committee. It's a small committee. It's relatively obscure, but extremely important. If you think about it, the biggest business in this country is healthcare. It's about 17% of GDP, $3.2 trillion. The biggest driver of healthcare costs, I think, are inpatient hospitalizations, which is a third. The big, one of the biggest drivers of inpatient hospitalizations is surgery and doing procedures. So this committee takes every procedure, breaks it down to pre, intra, and post-operative steps, and, assign, and defines those steps and assigns time and weights to those steps. Well, we did the same thing. We took those same steps, but we mapped the KSAs to those steps. And we came up with a KSA score for every individual procedure, went through the methodology, uh, and made that fairly robust. Uh, and then we, once we did that, we had a metric, and then we developed a threshold, and then dashboards to actually measure to this particular metric. We did this first through general surgery. We realized it's not just about the surgeons, although we like to think about that all the time. Uh, we're really dependent on a team. So we extended that to the rest of the combat casualty care team. Orthopedic surgery, critical care, emergency medicine, anesthesia, physicians, nurses. And in all told, we've done all of these specialties so far. And that's about 4,000 KSAs in 63 domains. And then we started briefing this to leadership. And leadership said, okay, after initial resistance, first thing was, hey, you don't have a problem. There's no problem. You guys have been enormously successful in the last war. Then, well, your problem is really scary. You're talking about changing a lot of the things we do. Two, well, this is, hmm, we need to do this. Uh, do it faster. So we've done this uh, for the core combat casualty care team. And you can see on this list, We've been tasked to develop these KSAs for the rest of the combat casualty care team. So ophthalmology, CT surgery, OMFS, plastics, urology, vascular ENT, and neurosurgery. Uh, this, the whole gamut. And the military has adopted this approach and is doing it for 63 other specialties. So what are the pieces? The knowledge assessment. For, for the knowledge assessment, what we developed, and we did this in a year, is we wrote a question bank of over 500 questions using the same methodology that's used by the board, actually using the Pearson View software and the ITS platform, which the residents see when they take the outside exam, to develop a 200 question uh, examination that gives you 60 CME. The expectation is you take that knowledge assessment every three years, we'll give you domain level feedback, and if you don't do well, do well in a specific domain, you'll go back to an online curriculum that's hosted by the college LMS, review that, answer some questions that are specific to that domain, and you're, you have the knowledge. So they're essentially a, a retraining that is non-punitive. For the skills piece, and actually we ran through this uh, 
and a couple of the folks in the audience participated. We ran through the first iteration of the skills assessment and over the last two days here in town. Uh, remember I mentioned before skills were demonstration in the past. You go to a course, they show you uh, how to do proximal control in the asset course. You get to do it, but no one really assesses you doing that. So what we did over the last two days is we developed the Asset Plus course. We took what was in the asset course, vascular exposures for trauma. We added the gap, those skills that were, the other skills that were, uh, defined by the KSA blueprint. So things like a crany or an X fix or even a C section. We added that. We used perfused cadavers. We taught the folks how to do it. And the next day we used evaluative tools with a one to one faculty ratio to assess their proficiency. First run, the uh, first couple days, we'll have the data back in about a week. But I will tell you, it was outstanding. I could walk around and watch and say, that person's ready, that person needs more work. Those are those gap skills. And we covered the entire gamut of, uh, you know, essentially trauma exposures, both in the abdomen, in the chest, uh, and in the extremities. So, you know, I mentioned that KSA score. I'll come back to it because essentially it extracts the readiness value of routine practice and refocuses the MHS from encounters, primary care, to ensuring that we're in the operating room. And now we have metrics for emergency medicine, general surgery, orthopedic surgery, critical care. I'll tell you, if, I, if I'm looking at a hospital and the ER is busy and they have, they're meeting their metric, the surgeons are busy in the operating room, they're meeting their metric, and the ICU is busy and they're meeting their metric, you have a hospital and team that's ready. I think that's fairly obvious, but in the past we didn't have anything that we could actually measure that mattered. And it really changes the military model. In the past, we messed around with economic uh, models, RVU production, MGMAs, you know, and what was the result? Caseloads went down, GME programs were at risk, we couldn't code. The new metric, which is part of our quadruple aim performance plans, basically forces us to recapture high value cases. Guess what? You do that, your quality gets better, your GME gets better, and we're focused on the right thing. Uh, but in order to do this, you need buy-in. So one of the folks that we were sent to off to review this is CAPE. That is the Capabilities Assessment Program Evaluation in the Pentagon. That's the office that looks at missile systems. And they looked at us and very skeptical in the beginning. Close all the military hospitals, you know, uh, we need all trauma surgeons, blah, blah, blah. And they looked at what we did. They said, well, this is pretty good. We want to help you. We want to make this better. So we got them on board uh, and got CAPE to endorse the effort. We, we compared the, our metrics to uh, civilian centers. We were asked to do that. And guess what? The metrics kind of make sense. And if you look, and the metrics are really important because in the past people have tried simpler things. Well, we'll just count the number of cases. Well, that doesn't work. Here are two surgeons. One has 312 cases, uh, but they're doing a lot of low volume, low intensity, I mean, sorry, low intensity stuff, a bunch of endoscopy. Not that it's not good, important, but it doesn't really contribute that much to readiness. The other surgeon who's over the metric has done less cases, but they're doing a broader, bro broader scope of surgery and they're doing more complex stuff. Both are achievable, but one person's ready, one person's not. And then we built these dashboards. These dashboards let us actually manage to this metric. You can see it the high, from the individual to the facility uh, throughout the system. You can actually see what the hospital is doing. You can start to measure it. You could visualize it. You could see who's ready, who's not ready. You can see what's leaking out to purchase care. Uh, you know, remember, we run a, a hospital system, but we also run an insurance plan. And patients that are supposed to be seen in our hospitals are being seen in that insurance plan. And we could see that. And we started to see efficiencies. For example, the folks at uh, Fort Bliss, they were getting pushed back from bringing VA patients in. But now they had a metric, they can go to their leadership and say, hey, this is bringing readiness into our system. Okay, that makes sense. You can continue to bring these VA patients in. And how, do you, how are we using it locally? Well, we want to recapture those patients that belong in our system. We want to expand our business to include those VA patients. And then we want a partner to fill in those gaps. And it's really important to have top-down buy-in, top top-down and bottom-up buy-in. So I'll show you a couple of memos from our leadership. Essentially, this effort has been endorsed by the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. But more importantly, the folks that are using it are seeing the value in the approach. And these are just a couple of those leadership memos. And then you need to sustain it. 
It's one thing to get this started, then you need to build the infrastructure within the military health system to keep this going, to make it part of the fabric and the DNA, and that's what we're doing right now. And I think the key is the community participation. I think I counted recently about 60, you know, 60 to 80 military physicians have been involved in developing the KSAs at some level, writing the questions and the like. And finally, the persistence. We track this stuff every single week for every specialty. Where are they along their journey? And these are, this is a slide I put together for the uh, National Defense University about four or five months, about four months ago, looking at where we were in next steps. And you can see on the next steps, you know, we've achieved most of those next steps, uh, but there is one frowny face, and that's the uh, anesthesiologist. They're always giving us a headache. Uh, and, and so the bottom line, how to actualize change. You need a problem. Ours was perishable skills. The timing has to be right. The National Defense Authorization Act, aligned leadership. You need an unassailable solution set. It was really important having that, those folks in the Pentagon look up, look at this. You need to socialize up and down. Uh, Matt mentioned, I think I briefed this to leadership over 100 times. You need community buy-in, and then you need persistence, and we are still at it. And that's where we are with the steps from Carter's article. Uh, we're not there yet, but uh, I think we're moving forward apace. Thank you.